Well, my name is Katalin Voss, and I have beaten the often path uh, by, you know, great acts of grace from a fantastic network of, of mentors and people around me. Welcome back to the Beat the Often Path podcast, where we showcase unusual success stories to help us all see the bigger picture in our lives, our life's work, our mission, and our careers. I'm your host, Ross Palmer, and we have got an absolutely electrifying show for you today. My guest today is Catalina Voss, a man on a mission in Silicon Valley. Catalina is one of those rare individuals who are on the absolute bleeding edge of tech and who put social entrepreneurship first. He's been named to Forbes 30 Under 30. His startup, Ello, uses machine learning to teach children how to read, potentially around the world. He's used AI to look into criminal justice reform in the United States, and he's used augmented reality to help give people with autism emotional cues. In short, he's a brilliant man. Today, we talk about mentorship in Silicon Valley, getting your ideas off the ground, and how you can make a difference in our modern world, putting impact ahead of profit. So there's so much to get into. I'll just get right to it. Here's Kathleen Voss. Well, that's a very humble way to begin and a very fitting for the amount of stuff that you have done, which is truly, truly impressive. Ladies and gentlemen listening, we are in the midst of a bona fide genius here. I think I can say that safely. So I'll do my best not to look like a complete idiot in today's episode. Um, Catalin, tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you have been working on and have been building. Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, I think um, I like to work on social applications of largely machine learning and, uh, and, and AI sort of projects. Um, somewhere around the time when I joined college, um, I more or less decided for myself that I'm going to, you know, if I'm in this very privileged position to to have the resources I have and 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 be able to pretty much build anything I want to build. Uh, I will try to build stuff that helps people, um, and that's more or less what I've done. I mean, there's there's not a super consistent theme to it. Um, it's it's honestly just trying to build good things for the world. I've spent a large chunk of my time at Stanford building a learning aid for kids with autism based on computer vision, basically it's a pair of glasses that you put on based on Google Glass that tell you how people around you feel. It's an idea that was originally inspired by my cousin. Um, I started a company in Kenya building a computer vision based point of sale system for emerging markets, we got bought by MasterCard. Um, I returned to my PhD and began working um, in, in natural language processing and trying to use machine learning to pull data out of uh, large amounts of criminal justice records to try to figure out what uh, what that reveals about the American justice process, um, which isn't quite so glorious. Um, and then <laughs> you don't now say. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and now I'm back off in the entrepreneurial world, um, building a new company called Ello, and, uh, and we teach kids how to read using speech recognition technology. Um, so it's really been all over the map, to be honest. So it seems with an incredible common thread. And are you in Silicon Valley right now? I'm at my office in San Francisco, yeah. San Francisco, yeah. okay. So the heart of the beast. So you're doing it for real. And also when you're talking about things getting bought by MasterCard, let there be no mistake, you are very, very much in the epicenter of what's going on, which is awesome, and Stanford as well. So originally you hail from Germany and you moved to the, to Silicon Valley when you were 17 years old. How did that come about? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I showed up here for the first time actually two years before that uh, when I was ah, 15. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, I sort of say it was like great acts of grace of mentorship. Um, and, I, and I think it's very much true. There, there was a guy named um, uh, Steve Capps who I, I had tracked down, who, uh, you know, worked on the original Macintosh team at Apple. And um, I basically, I mean, my dream was I was building iPhone apps in high school because I hated school. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, that was, that seemed like more fun. And um, it was a sort of time where the only way to build iPhone apps was to teach yourself how to do it because 
the iPhone was like two years old. And so there really weren't any resources. There weren't any books. It's just, you just had to just mess around with stuff. So, you know, any 15 year old was as good as any 60 year old at doing it in, in some sense. Right. Um, and I had tracked down Steve Capps originally because I wanted to work at Apple and, and their legal department said, no freaking way. Um, and, uh, and I thought maybe, you know, since he started a new company, um, that was a more viable path. And it turned out that my dad's friend's daughter had gone to the same school as Steve's daughter. And Whoa. somehow, you know, my, my resume landed on his desk and, and he gave me my first shot basically, right? Like okay. he invited me to go build, um, build the iPhone app for this company called Pay Near Me, which is building a, a cash payment system for the underbanked population of the U.S. Um, I came and did that and realized like, oh boy, uh, half of my office, you know, went to Stanford and these are people here who, you know, work because they like to do it. They don't need any more money. <laughs> right. They don't need anything. They don't have anything to prove to themselves. I mean, they've achieved everything there is to achieve uh, wow. and, and by any sort of measurable career standards. Right. Um, and I thought that was quite inspiring. And, you know, at the time I was still very, very blue eyed and, uh, and it was all new and, and amazing to me. Um, and I learned to code from Steve at his kitchen table, you know, his uh, wife helped me figure out how to like what an SAT is, how to, you know, prepare American college applications. Ah. I got back to Germany, had to get my grade point average to somewhere reasonable territory. Yeah. Um, and then it somehow worked out. I met a girl along the way. That, of course. That was part of it. Too. As one does. Yeah. Yeah. What an incredible story. So did you immediately feel at home in the greater San Francisco area? Were you immediately drawn to it? I do love the people here. I mean, I okay. do think people people here are quite quite welcoming. And I and I feel it every time I come back from Europe mm. in some sense. Um and um and yeah, I mean there's just such an incredible density of mentorship around here of people mm. who uh you know, have done well themselves and are now giving back to the ecosystem and who don't really ask for anything in return other than that you pay it forward. What a wonderful concept. I love that. Okay, so you studied uh, at Stanford, you studied artificial intelligence or what did you originally start studying? Computer science? Yeah, com yeah computer science. I mean, I sort okay. of, I realized that I had been quite blessed to be able to sort of learn how to code before coming to Stanford and so uh, when I got there, it was really clear that um, I wanted to do the things that I couldn't do outside of college, right? Mm. Like anyone can, I feel like there's a lot of stuff you can teach yourself online at this point, Definitely. but there's certain things that, you know, for me are just too hard, <laughs> to be honest. Yes. And theoretical computer science and math was part of that. So I did a lot of theory um, and, and then machine learning and AI, and it's just sort of, you know, proof-based linear algebra. You know, I know some people who can, I can just give them the book and they will teach themselves proof-based linear algebra. I can't do that. I need a TA and a professor by my side to guide me through the class. Uh, and then I also, you know, um, try to expand my horizon, right? So I spent some time doing mechanical engineering, learning how to use a mill and a lathe and just sort of stuff that like you need a, 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 <laughs> the product realization lab for, you can't do that at home. Right. Um, so that was really the focus. Okay. And so while you were going to school, were you working on the side or were you just committing entirely to the school process? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was always working on the side. Okay. Yeah. I always yeah. had, you know, two or two or three projects going on. And then, um, you know, really eventually, I don't know why it's just sort of since freshman year, I've, I've, I've been somewhat allergic to the idea of doing traditional internships or, or, just a regular job. Um, and so I, I've been doing my own thing um, pretty much, pretty much the whole time. I, um, you know, for one, I had to figure out how to pay for school. Right. Um, that was the other thing. So you did I that yourself. At, yeah. I mean, more or less again, I mean, sort of, I, I ended up becoming a, a, a venture partner for um uh, for a large European publishing company called Dexter Springer that um, set up um, uh, their, um, their, their 
publishing business and wanted to start an investment arm in the Bay Area. And the deal was sort of, I'd help them invest into startups. And um, uh, in return, they'd pay for school uh, or something wow. like that. That came about um, through a woman named uh, Shay Didana, Tate Didana, um, who was one of the investors at, at Pinyami and now is the mom of my goddaughters and, and just one of my closest friends. Um, and she really helped me figure out how to, you know, there's just so many people involved along the way, but she was one of those people who just helped me figure out, sat down with me, made a spreadsheet. It was like, okay, yeah. this is, this is, you can work this much during the summer, et cetera. And then I showed up having saved enough money to pay for the first year. But, um, but I, after that, there was no plan, right? It was like, mm-hmm. oh, let's see what happens. I guess yeah, I'll just right. drop out at the end of the year. Yeah. Um, and, you know, international financial aid, you have kind of have to pay in full, basically. So, um, yeah, she made that. She was my chief negotiator with uh, Axel Springer. And she managed to get that deal set up for me. Um, and, um, and then that gave me the freedom to, you know, th- that was sort of the, the first side hustle. And then that gave me the freedom to spend serious amounts of time on, um, on you know, like building stuff, which is really what I wanted to do, right? Like uh, uh, building emotion recognition and face tracking software originally with um, uh, with my co-founder, Tom Sayer, the same guy who I'm now running Elo with. Um, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's sort of, it's full cycle. It's very nice. Um, and, uh, and then eventually that turned into the Autism Glass Project at Stanford. Boop! This is the point where we use an awkward transitional sound effect to get us into the commercial portion of this podcast, but don't worry, it's benign. All I'm merely suggesting is that if you like these stories, if you appreciate this kind of podcast, then understand that it takes an incredible amount of work to put this together, to find these people, to edit it, and do all of that stuff for your easy consumption every week. So if you enjoy it, and if you get value from it, I just ask a few simple things. Please rate the show five stars on Apple Podcasts, wherever you find it. Subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, you name it. Leave a good review. And most importantly, share. Share this episode. Share it on your feed, on your timeline. Share it with somebody who needs to benefit from this because there is incredible gold in this episode and a little sneaky little golden nugget buried at the very end of this episode. So keep on listening. Here is Cataline back to the show. Could you help us with a little bit of a timeline? So I know you started doing iOS development and you made some tutorials. You had a podcast and it I quickly did, became yeah. the number one podcast in the German iTunes store. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, yeah, as I said, right? Like on the internet, nobody knows how old you are. And, um, and right. <laughs> I was just showing my screen, not my face. So ah. that, that worked out well for me. So you were, and this, this is, I guess, you would have been 15 at that time or? I started out when I was 13, yeah. And then I, I started working with a German company when I was okay. 14. And I started working with an American company when I was 15. Um, and then kept doing that until I graduated from, from high school in Germany and then moved out to, to Stanford. Truly incredible. So some of these projects <laughs> that you've done, I mean, yeah, I'm blown away. What can yeah, I okay. say? I'm, I'm just like, this is unbelievable. Yeah. I think uh, it's clear, listeners, that we're dealing with a special individual here. You're making um, me uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's just I'm blown. <laughs> let's let's get into it. I don't mean to, but I'm just. I mean, very you know, that's what I, I I joke. That's where my career peaked, right? Yeah. Like it's sort of, uh, I, love <laughs> I peaked at 17, and listen, I mean, now I'm 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 26. Yeah. So it's, it's it's no longer cool. It's, that's right. <laughs> you're you're old. You're no longer uh, I'm, I'm one old. of those yeah, special I'm people. Old. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's all downhill. You know, I'm, I'm only 35, so what do I know? <laughs> um, but you, so you started these really cool projects. Um, obviously, so Autism Glass Project, let's dive in there. Tell us yeah. about that project. Yeah. How did so, that come about? Where was the idea for that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I want to say that we follow like a nice design process. And, you know, we wrote the word autism on a whiteboard and then drove a big circle around it and, and thought about how to solve autism. That's not what we did. Um, <laughs> and surprisingly, uh, it was really, you know, more of a nerdy adventure. It was sort of I was working on face tracking software with applications yes. in education and the automotive industry, stuff like making sure a driver stays awake on the wheel. Um, and we were building software to measure facial engagement and emotions. 
Um, and then, you know, it just sort of dawned on me that, hey, I had this cousin who struggled recognizing emotions. Um, he struggled with recognizing emotions. And um, he had to learn that in, in, um, in a form of ABA therapy, applied behavioral analysis. And, you know, the, he, he turned out to have a really wonderful journey. But the way that this is normally done in ABA therapy is kids learn, kids with autism are sort of taught to learn how to recognize emotions with flashcards. And oh. um, it's pretty real world removed. Um, and for some kids it works, but for others, like we had this kid in our study who, you know, looked at some guy and mom told the story. She pointed at a guy on the street and was like, he looks angry. And mom's like, he's not angry. And she's like, but he has a beard. And, you know, it turns out all the angry men and flashcards have beards. And that's sort of what she latched onto. Um, and we figured, well, if we're building software that teaches machines to recognize emotions, um, can we help teach kids who struggle with that to recognize emotions? It was around the time that Google Glass came onto the market. And, you know, they really didn't have so much success finding, um, uh, I guess, consumer applications for that, though I still think AR is going to come. Um, but, you know, they, it seemed like this was just an opportunity to just use that form factor. It's just an Android phone strapped onto your head, essentially. So, so well, sure, you know, can we use a camera to track people around you? And then can you start doing this sort of emotion recognition exercises um, and improve your eye contact and things like that, if, if, if you so desire, um, in the setting where you actually care about it, which is at home with the people you spend the most amount of time with, which is your family. Sure. Um, and so we built that and we try to get um, venture funding for it, attention, uh, but people really didn't uh, think that was such a good idea. I mean, it just made no sense to investors. So it was like risky, okay. hardware device, small market, autism, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so we realized, you know, honestly, they, we, we're, we're so happy we're actually at the university. The university has a med school. Um, this is the place to do it. Why don't we just do this here? Uh, and I talked to some of my professors, Terry Winograd, um, who, uh, you know, was, I, I really just loved him in, in, in the CS classes that I took with him. Um, and, uh, and he said, I don't know anything about autism, but I know Carl Feinstein, the head of child psychiatry, so I actually talked to him and then Carl said, uh, I know some stuff about autism, but nothing about machine learning, but you should talk to this new guy, Dennis Wall, who's been coming over from Harvard. And um, we sort of formed this group around the three of them. And Dennis was the first one to take me on. And again, was that first person who, you know, took a bet on me. I was like, okay, well, why don't you, you freshman here, draw up a budget. And I drew him a budget. It was like $80,000. I wanted to bring my, my, um, you know, former co-founder um, and uh, back in for postdoc effectively and, um, you know, for, for, for something like a semester. And, and he made that happen. And then because of that, we were able to raise grant funding and run studies out of the med school. And eventually Google started donating the glasses to Packen mm -hmm. Foundation and the NIH funded it. Uh, and it became a thing. And, mm -hmm. you know. So that was your first real taste of building something that became a success, if you will, a small success. How, how wide is it? A small adopted? success. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's not, yeah, it doesn't have the widespread reach yet that I would have hoped it had. At sure. this point, to be honest, um, it's a really long path. Sure. Um, and um, yeah, so it, it was, um, we ran studies up to, up to something like around 150 families um, at Stanford. And I know for a fact that we made sort of, some of those people's lives better. And that feels really good. Yeah. Um, but we haven't taken it to massive scale yet. It was licensed to Dennis's company, Cognoa, who built an autism diagnostic. Um, and, and they've taken it forward in, in clinical trials to, to push towards uh, class two clearance, but they're still not fully there. Mm -hmm. I see. And was this the start of something? So what I'm very fascinated with is that thing, that moment where people decide to go in on an idea because mm -hmm. obviously you could have chosen anything, you could have picked literally anything to apply, and you chose this idea, and it sounds like you were confronted at the very outset with some tension maybe between commercial success or potential commercial success and some sort of ideal. The ideal being, I want to help people with autism, the commercial success being early investors not 
enjoying or uh, not wanting to invest in the idea because the market was too small. Is that a tension that you've experienced throughout your career so far between things that you want to do and the commercial, commercial, commercial <laughs> aspect of it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's what social entrepreneurship is all about, right? It's about that tension. Like Allo now is a public benefit corporation, which means that we're a for-profit company, but we have a social goal written in our charter. So our goal is not just to maximize value of the shareholders, but also to uh, you know, do whatever it says in that piece of our charter. And, and in, in our case, you know, that's now something around um, improving child literacy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you can do both at the same time, that's fantastic. I just am pretty pragmatic about it. So for one, I have the privilege of not caring so much about money. And I don't know why that is, but it comes from a feeling of just always being really blessed about it it's not you know my like my dad's broke and my, my parents aren't aren't rich but they've done it perfectly well mm. um but it's you know it's um i just feel like as you heard right in this just ridiculous thing this guy shows up at college and doesn't know how to pay for it and suddenly these like bags of money appear from germany and they just like that has happened just over and over and over again <laughs> in my life for just some weird reason yeah like I, like an act of grace i have always felt taken care of yeah and that has freed me up to like not just comfortable but just you know like a little bit above comfortable and i i just feel so lucky about that and then that has freed me up to just really think about, well, what's the best way to make this change happen? Mm -hmm. And then I think that really depends on the kind of change you're trying to make happen, right? So um, there are things that are best done in a research institution. There are things that are best done at a large company. There are things that are clearly commercial endeavors. There are things that are clearly nonprofits. There should not be a profitability goal attached to them. There are things that I think the only way I'm running into this with the uh, the recon project in, in criminal justice, we're, we're looking at parole in California now, uh, that, that they have to be done in a political context, which, by the way, I have no idea how to do. Um, and so I think it's more like you choose the right context for uh, the problem than the other way around, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, to be honest, I'm also very guided by... Um, by other people in that sense, by, by my co-founders, by the people I find who identify these sorts of interesting problems and then bring them to me. And I'm sort of, you know, have technology will travel. Like right. I, just, I can then build stuff. You can build stuff. You know, there's this saying that's been doing the rounds, you might have heard it, where they asked people how much money they would need to be happy. And, you know, right. it's the classic thing where somebody who makes $100,000 a year says, if I had a million dollars, then I'd be happy. They ask a millionaire. If I had $10 million, I'd be happy. They ask a 10 millionaire. If I had 100 million, if I had a private jet, I'd be happy. And they found that the happiest people were the people who just believed that whatever money they needed would sort of flow into their life, regardless right. of a specific amount. Just when I need something, it will show up. <laughs> that certainly seems to have been the case for you. Was that always a belief that you had, even when you were younger? Or is that something that you've just learned based on your own life's experience? Yeah, I, I do think it was, I mean, it was shaped in a, a bit by by um, by my family and my dad. I mean, that was, he just always had that very ridiculous attitude towards money. He won the lottery uh, in <laughs> Like okay. at one point for, for the one like I don't know two hundred thousand Deutsche Mark, Whoa. and he bought a really expensive sofa and put it in our living room, and that's Wonderful. still like reminiscent of that kind of I don't know. For him, it was always like if there's a little bit more in than out, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's it'll be it'll be fine. Um, but look, I mean, I think it's it's uh, it's immense privilege. And don't get me wrong, if things didn't look like that, I do obviously. Right, like you just you you have to have a certain base level of comfort for that for that to be a reality, and we fortunately have it. We're in a time of great peace and and uh, uh, and like technological power, and sort of it turns out, yeah, if you if you can write good code right now, you can sort of that's you that's a fine insurance policy. You yeah. you will be able to make money. Um, You're shaping the current and future world, literally. 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. But you're also just like doing something that people are willing to pay for. People, yeah, that people need. So it, it sort of feels like, yeah. But yeah, but you know, if, um, whatever, I mean, I, I, I do think there's, there's, there's lines there, obviously. Like my girlfriend got pregnant tomorrow. I would be, oh, okay. Yeah. I, I should probably pay a little bit more attention to that. But, right. Right. And you'd be willing to do that. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's been said, I can't remember which startup it was, but I think it was before Facebook. Somebody said that, I don't know what the next great startup is going to be, but I can tell you that it's going to be within a mile of where we're sitting right now, referring to somewhere in Silicon Valley. <laughs> to what degree do you think physical location is important for these kinds of ideas that you have? Do you need to be there to achieve these kinds of things? No, I don't think so. Not anymore. I mean... It's, you know, it's, and I think it's sort of um, a little bit ridiculous arrogance to postulate that you do. Uh, we've really seen that in the last year. I mean, our team is distributed as I, right? Like I started, um, I helped start to connect in, in Kenya. And um, so we have now, Elo now has employees in Kenya again because of that, uh, that are, you know, obviously uh, 10 time zones removed from us. And that works perfectly fine for me. I just wake up a little earlier and we do our engineering stand-up call and, uh, and that's fine. Um, I, I, I do think there's, there's a high concentration here of, of still an incredible engineering talent pool of money and of people who want to give back to the ecosystem. And I love that. Um, but I think a lot of people have proven that you don't, you know, you don't need to be here anymore to make that happen. Interesting. Okay. Well, let's dive in a little bit to Elo. What sure. is the idea of this? And when did you know? Another interesting question that I have is when do you know to start a new project? So you've got an existing project. When do you say I'm ready to take on something new? <laughs> okay, sure. I mean, so... Um, Interesting. The, 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 it was a little bit two things coincided there, right? Um, I was back in the PhD, and as you can tell, I probably don't make a great PhD student. In some sense, I am much more motivated by building stuff than making intellectual contributions. Um, and we were working on this criminal justice project that had kind of stalled um, because the state was refusing to provide some data to us. Um, it turned out we then later sued them and we got the data. Oh, okay, uh, but 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 it 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 just wasn't moving for the yeah. next year or something, and so it was a bit frustrating. Um, and at the same time, uh, my former co-founder had uh, quit his job at Google and decided he wanted to start a company. Um, and I will just say, sort of, I guess there's a there's a there's a short list of people, but there is a list of people. Uh, in my life that if they sort of, if they're free and want to do something together, I'm pretty down for that. I just sort of, it doesn't, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I just believe in them so much and, 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 and what they're doing that, um, that I'm excited to work with them more or less, no matter what. And, Whatever and that was, I'm in. yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that was the case with Tom. And so, um, he started originally uh, a somewhat adjacent but different business, um, providing parent support, um, basically trying to extend sort of child psychology services to the masses, um, mm. together with a clinical child psychologist, Elizabeth, who's our third co-founder, uh, who spent the past you know, 20 years um, with kids and families. And so it was something that was dear to my heart, this sort of general topic area. Um, but mostly, honestly, it was an opportunity to work with Tom again. And yeah. uh, I said, sure, let's go do that. Let's go join. Uh, we had an opportunity to join Y Combinator, um, which seemed like an interesting learning experience. And you and were so successful, we went to, right? You've been backed by Y Combinator, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were backed by YC over, for, for a different idea originally. Oh, and then, okay. and, then um, and then during the pandemic, whilst the three of us were working together, um, we stumbled upon about a year ago, we stumbled upon the idea for Allo because um, we were working. We sort of had a front row seat working with families um, in, in, in watching them take control uh, for better or worse of their child's education because mm. schools shut down. 
Right. I mean, just so many parents were left completely drowning. Yeah. Right? And just kids and moms. Do you have kids? I do. I was about to raise my hand. Like you said, parents okay. left completely drowning. I have a daughter who just turned three. I know the oh, feeling yeah. well. And and I know yeah. that if the kids are older, it's even crazier. If you have two or three, it's even more nuts. But even yeah. one, it's been a challenge. Right. And in particular at that young age, right? I mean, a, a 15-year-old, you can put them in front of a computer and say, hey, enjoy your day on Zoom. Um, they might not like it, but they'll do it. They'll do it. Um, just a you know a three year old or a six year old. Good luck. It's just not going to happen. Right. Um, and so we looked at different ways that we could support parents with that challenge because we realized kids were falling behind and reading just seemed like the most foundational problem. Um, it's just over the last year, reading scores in the U.S. have dropped forty percent. There's so many kids who just didn't yeah. have proper instruction, who just like forgot how to read. Mm, right. Yeah. And, um, and so uh, we tried to build something very actionable um, to to tackle that problem. And that's the idea behind Ello. Ello is a, a book subscription. Here I have the, the box. Uh, we ah. ship five books a month, um, and um, you know they they look like this. Okay. Um, and then this is Ello. He's this elephant, this sort of cute character. Um, who sits around on the screen on, on your iPad and the child reads to Ello. So unlike sort of most reading apps, which read to the child, in this case, the child reads to the app and Ello oh. helps them out. If they get stuck, motivates them to keep going. They you know get to earn stars and get a prize in next month's box and kind of gamify the experience. Wonderful. So what age do children begin with Ello? Uh, Five to seven, I would say, is sort of our sweet Five spot. Okay. Um, but we do have some four-year-olds. Yeah. It's it really, it's, it depends on, kids are so different, right? Sure. Um, it's basically right after they've done currently. Uh, our ambition eventually is to just teach you to read from start to finish. Uh, but right now we work in that gap where you sort of know basic phonics, but um, there's really nothing out there to practice fluency except for sitting down with a reading tutor who costs $100 an hour or right. an extremely engaged parent, but not all parents have the resources or the capabilities to do that. Mm. So it's a subscription. Does it require that you have an iPad to make the most yeah, of it? We're, we're, we're in a closed private beta right now, just really trying it with kids who, who we work extremely closely with. We, you know, we've, we run play tests with GoPros behind kids' backs, and similar to the way we did this with the Autism Glass Project, are gradually opening it up. Uh, right now, it's iPad only, um, but we 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 plan to have Android support before the end of the year, and then we'll start to bring it onto onto smartphones um, as well to just sort of make it really accessible. That's wonderful. Have the early signs been encouraging? Has there been some indicators that? People are learning that children are learning how to read effectively. Yeah, it's 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 quite heartwarming. It's quite heartwarming. It's actually been quite good. I I was you know it was a speech recognition for kids turns out to be an immense technical challenge. Hmm. It's just kids speak so differently from adults, right? And so we spent like something like nine months just really working on that, and then two three months ago we 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 launched we put this out there in in this private beta circle um yeah and it's moved the needle there, there seem to be some families in particular families who for whom reading was a fight with their kids were like my child is asking to read this is such a gift um and 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 who have moved up in levels um there's one kid with selective mutism um whose mom didn't know that he could read Whoa. and so we've got interaction on uh, you know recorded it's just uh, with the mom te live texting texting my co-founder elizabeth um we he took Ella out of the box and he started reading to the elephant on his ipad and mom starts crying because wow. you know, she's like oh my god he's he knows how to read i had no idea um That's and beautiful. so so there, there were there are some of those really really beautiful stories that were like oh my god I, this feels again like a little bit like the beginnings of the autism Dust project felt where um, you know, and now the, the question is, okay, cool. Can we, can we scale that? Can we get a lot of people to experience that? 
You know, it's good that uh, that there's difference in speech recognition between adults and children because I don't want my daughter to be able to order 4,000 rolls of <laughs> pink heart stickers from Alexa. <laughs> I hope Alexa doesn't understand her for as long as possible, but I yeah. hope that you succeed where they fail. Um, mm. So that's really great. So you have a genesis of an idea. You have a partnership. You have a team. You know who you want to do these things with. And then in each case, you get a moment, perhaps, where there's a spark and you feel something and you say, hey, I'm on to something here or I could be on to something. Is that what motivates you to go forward? Obviously, money not being the ultimate goal? Yeah. I mean, I, I do think that, um, you know, I, I like to play with the cards that I'm dealt and and try to make relatively immediate impact. And so uh, when we're building Allo, money is a very clear signal, right? It's, 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 it's a means to an end, but it's a very clear signal. If somebody, there's something really honest about building a consumer business and finding product market fit that I respect. Like if somebody says, oh, this is so good. I want to hand you dollar bills to, because I want to have this product. That's uh, just, just a very clear signal that you have a product that, um, that deserves to exist. In, in some sense. Um, and so if you can then use that as a lever to scale it, um, that's wonderful. And I mean, that's, so that's very much the, I think that's very much a traditional uh, paid consumer product journey that we're starting with. Right. Um, hello. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, the, the ambition is to then scale that to somewhere where it can solve, you know, uh, literacy globally. Um, and that's that will wonderful. involve making it much, much, much cheaper. That will involve building digital-only versions. That will involve getting into language learning um, in, in around the world. Um, I, I mentioned already, right? Like a chunk of our team is in Kenya, so sure. a, a chunk of our investors is in is in Europe. So we sort of we have the ambition to do that relatively quickly, um, but you know, we also. My, my co-founder did go to business school and, you know, we, we, we try to use capitalism as a lever right now. It's, um, that's, at least for this project, that's what we're doing. Right. Do you ever consider to do the uh, buy one, give one model, like the Tom's model where I can buy it for my child and I donate one to another child? Yeah, or like Warby Parker. Yeah, I think just yeah. I, tremendous opportunity to do similar things like that. And like, for example, um, and we started doing like book donations. It's just like the most immediate actionable okay. thing for us, right? Yeah. There, there are lots of kids who just don't have any access to books. And so, um, you know, if parents want to want to donate um, the, 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 the books, we, we, we do that. Um, so, yeah, I bet. But awesome. we'll see what, the, what, the, what our, what our long term plan is. That's so great. And for our listeners who are maybe not so tech savvy or in the world, um, Y Combinator is uh, one of the, perhaps the most well-known startup incubators and certainly one of the most prestigious companies like, what, Airbnb, DoorDash, uh, yeah, Dropbox. Yeah. A number of the most right. successful startups in the world have come from Y Combinator. So it's, it's serious. So how, how did you get hooked up with Y Combinator? Uh, I mean, honestly, that was mostly my co-founder, okay. um, Tom, who sort of set that up initially. But um, you just apply at the end of the day. I mean, they're, they're, yeah, you get some recommendations and you, and you try to use the leverage you have. You get people to write emails. But at the end of the day, they're, they're a sizable program now. They've expanded globally quite a bit. A ton of the companies now come from India and Africa, which is just oh. so good to see. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, we were just like everyone else. I mean, we had to go go to the interview and, you know, to do the whole, do a lot of practice interviews and you get this 10 minute rapid fire questions, uh, very concise response, unlike what I'm doing right now. Um, and then <laughs> they call you on the same day and make you an offer or, or don't. Uh, That's the it. same day. That's it. Yeah, and do you yeah. do you go over there? I mean, it's it's also in person, right? Or it was in person? Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, we were the first batch that sort of demo day got ruined by COVID. Uh, um, uh, so shoot. it was it was starting just as we were 
Yeah. Um, most of our batch was still in person. Now it's pretty much all online. Right? It's, Makes sense. Um, which is which has enabled even more global access. So that has its pros as well. Definitely. Um, the recon project, criminal justice. What was the idea there? Uh, what is the idea there? Um, so, uh, yeah, Recon's idea is to um, use machine learning for a different purpose than it is normally used in criminal justice context. The sort of prevailing application for ML in law is, uh, people think of that, they think of risk assessment. I want to assess the risk that somebody else is going to commit another crime and then ideally sort of keep them behind bars longer or if that's the case or whatever. I've seen that movie. Um, it was called Minority Report. Yeah, exactly. But it's, it turns out to be real. Um, and we think you. that's quite the problem, right? Yeah. Uh, and so we, we sort of envision a different role for machine learning, which is what if we can instead scrutinize decision-making processes? And so um, one way that can look like is uh, parole in California is the main mechanism by which um, California could reduce its massively overcrowded prison population. So California has um, highest incarceration, uh, one of the highest incarceration rates in the world, right? It's like up there with Texas and, and the US, 25% of California's prisoners are lifers. Up as much as like half of its, I believe 110,000 prisoners at this point will come up for parole at some point. Mm. And when they come up for parole, they have this hearing uh, three hours long they basically sit down with a presiding and a deputy commissioner who is supposed to stare them into the soul in the presence of their lawyer and decide whether or not they pose an unreasonable risk to public safety. Uh, now, how can machine learning help? Well, it turns out risk assessment is really useful, sorry, really useless thing to do in this context. Uh, and the reason is that um, you're basically extremely unlikely to commit another crime. If you get out on parole, life for recidivism is below 3%. Hmm. Um, and so, uh, but the problem that still prevails is that this process is entirely obscure, right? It's sort of, it's, it's these two people that make a call on the spot. Right. And the only public information they produce is this 150 page transcript that gets filed somewhere. Okay. And so, you know, between 2007 and 2019, there were 35,000 of these transcripts right. that were produced. And so what we did is we asked the state for all of them. Okay. And um, then um, said, can we use machine learning tools to read all of them, to try to pull out information from these individual cases about what went on in each wow. case? Yeah. Uh, glean some systematic trends, sort of provide some reconnaissance. And um, once we've done that, think about what does this system look like? Do we want the system to look like this? Are there systematic changes that we need to make? Um, but then also take it down to individual cases and mm -hmm. provide reconsideration at the, an opportunity for reconsideration at the case level, mm -hmm. perhaps, right? Like now that we know that these injustices exist, well, here are five people that last week were denied parole and sentenced for another seven years mm -hmm. because they got the wrong commissioner and the district attorney showed up and made a statement opposing parole. Mm -hmm. But their cases look exactly the same as these other 20 cases that were granted, right? right? They've been you know, busted when they were 16 on their third strike offense have been in prison for 60 years, disciplinary free for the past 20 years, you know, found Jesus, whatever else you want. And for some reason, you know, parole commissioner raises the flag and says, well, but eight years ago, you attempted to possess inmate manufactured alcohol. And, you know, we really think that um, that, 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 that shows that, you can unreason you 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 can't reasonably be trusted um, with, with with being a public member of society. Mm. Um, so we try to find those edge cases, right? Um, and but also provide an opportunity for systematic reform. That's so good. I think there was something like that in Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, about how these big mm -hmm. decisions are made by humans, and these decisions are impacted by things like whether the person has eaten lunch that day, right? 
or I've I've done ten cases in the morning, and this is the last case before lunch. Forget yeah. it. You know that th- we're impacted by those kinds of things. Um, but yeah. obviously, I mean, yeah. all the wrong things seem to matter. Right. That's sort of. Yeah, and all the right things seem to not matter so much. And yeah, um, it's 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 not a great picture, unfortunately. And even though the algorithm will do a better job, to your point about the political nature, it's something that we don't we're not ready to trust algorithms versus human opinion on these types of matters are we well i think you know we have lots of places in our legal system where we really value discretionary human judgment Mm. um right there's this idea that um uh, that that fairness comes not just from a process that is consistent but also a process that um considers the individual Right, considers individual mitigating circumstances. And that's something that no algorithm can do. I think there's a very good chance that we, you know, that the legislature looks at the stuff that we've done and they say, well, you know, but we still we we still really want humans to make parole decisions. Mm. We think that that's a that's a good idea. Um, that's not for me to judge. That's a legal philosophical question, you know, Kristen. Uh, Bell at the University of Oregon writes books about this sort of stuff and, and moral philosophy. Right. Um, but but it, it, I think there are places where human discretionary judgment is really important. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we also somehow have a desire for consistency, mm-hmm. right? We want like cases to be treated alike. We don't, humans have issues. They are systematically biased in some cases. Mm-hmm. And so the question I would ask is, well, how can we marry our desire for a human-led process with our desire for a consistent process. And is that something that technology can help in? Mm-hmm. Um, and and, and that's, that's the question that we're trying to, to explore with the Recon Project. And, you know, our role in that as computer scientists is to shine light onto the dark, right? To, to provide a, a, an opportunity to X-ray and a, a system that you previously couldn't look at. Mm. Um, but it requires all of the stakeholders and sort of humans involved in this process to come to the table to then decide what we're going to do about that. Right. But of course, if nobody's analyzed it to begin with, you, people don't even know, like you said, why are these things being decided the way they've been decided? And now you can at least say, hey, this is how it's been going. Do you like that or not? Yeah. And then people can yeah, say, hey, exactly. that's not good. We don't like that. Yeah, exactly. Let's we don't like that. And so that, what, what should we do about yeah. it? Right? Should we should we try to start reviewing some more of these denial cases? Should we are there normative rules that we want to set up? Right. Like, should the legislature consider doing things like, look, if you've been disciplinary free for more than this amount of time, and more than you know, the, the, should we move to a default grant system of parole like we have it in Europe, right? And I like in Germany. Life sentence more or less basically means 12 years. Mm. Uh, like after 10 years, you start to go home on the weekends and see your family. We reintegrate you into society slowly. Um, and then if you sort of like, you know, good behavior prevails, you basically graduate. Um, so, I mean, there, there are lots of options here. Um, but it's clear that the current system isn't working. Yes, I have to agree with you there. Um, Well, these are some three really great projects that we've discussed. Very fascinating stuff. I know I want to be mindful and respectful of your time here, so I want to do a couple rapid-fire things, just uh, (laughs) general-life stuff. So I think for most of the world, the idea of Silicon Valley or startup, that world feels very foreign, very unattainable, very distant. To a young person, or maybe not even a young person, but a person out there who would like to make the kind of impact that you've been able to have, what advice do you have for somebody in terms of getting plugged in or getting started? Yeah, I mean, I do really think that you can guess a lot of people's emails and just reach out to them. Steve at (laughs) Tim at (laughs) Apple.com. Yeah, I don't know about him, but awesome. They they tend to be just surprisingly willing to help, especially if they see a little part of of themselves in you. Um, if they emphasize with your story, it's just been just shocking to me how willing people are to help. 
so I would say you don't have to, you know, bang your head against the wall, reach out to people um, and find the types of mentors that are willing to support you and don't ask for anything in return because they exist. And, and, and then hold on to those people for, um, for, for the foreseeable future and when they pay it forward. Yeah, that's, that's fabulous. What, what is the best piece of advice that you've received from any of your mentors? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. What is the best piece of advice that I've received um, from any of my mentors? I mean, there's so much. There are so, there, there are so, so, so many pieces. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I can pin it down to any one of them. Um, I mean, there's, there's one that sticks somewhere in my head right now. I don't know quite why, um, but it was something I was thinking about recently um, when I was trying to decide how much to diverge from my core skill set. Um, <laughs> but it, this is very practical sure. advice. Uh, but this was um, a guy named Martin Rosheisen who... Um, my God, I mean, he has done so much fantastic stuff. He was a, he was a PhD student when Larry Page and Sergey Brin were PhD students at Stanford and Terry Winogradz, oh, wow. who, who's one of my mentors. Um, and uh, Martin um, listened to all this sort of crazy stuff I was thinking about doing and he just kind of brought me back to, to the ground. I was like, well, Kathleen, yeah, this is all great, but for your first company, uh, do something you know. Just do, do, do something you've studied. Do something where you have a competitive advantage. Do something that you can do better than anyone else. Um, and I mean, I, I, I do think that was actually quite helpful. I sort of, I sometimes tend to go too crazy and too broad. Um, That's fabulous. So. I love that. And so you've done a lot of social things. Do you see yourself always putting the mission first for the rest of your career? Do you think you will always be focusing on social issues as you go forward? As, as long as I have the privilege to, yes, right? I mean, I think um, I, um, yeah, pretty much, also, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think that's pretty sad. Um, you know, the, the only thing that would change things is I'm human and I there, there are things that are, of utmost importance to me, just like they are to most people, right? Like the security of my own family um, and, and just those sorts of things. And so, um, right, whatever. If, uh, if I suddenly find myself with two kids or God forbid something happens to, to my loved ones and I need to step in, then, then yep. that just comes first. I understand. Um, well, I think it's wonderful what you're doing. I think, it, I, you know, what I love and why I was so drawn to your story to wrap things up here was... When people have that kind of raw talent, when you have the ability to build anything, when you have the ability to shape the world, um, so many people that I've seen are just only interested in the money. That's it. Just what will make the most money. I don't care what it does. I don't care about any harm it might cause. I never even consider that. What will make me the most money? So it's really refreshing to see any time that there's somebody who has a good head on their shoulders and says, I could build something. And I'm going to choose to build these things that serve the world at large. So I say kudos to you for doing that and, you know, keep keep doing that. And I, I think it's it's rare. It's unfortunately a bit too rare. But I'm glad that you're out there doing that and that you're thinking about bigger issues than just yourself. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. You know, I, 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 um, I fortunately, I don't think it is so, so, so rare. I'm, I'm, I'm really encouraged by the amount of interest we get from, you know, say for the recon project from undergrad students at Stanford, or, um, but I, I think there's actually a real, there's starting to be a real cultural desire to use technology for good. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, as far as, you know, your, your listeners are concerned, um, if, 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 if there's anyone out there who likes to work on this kind of stuff or, um, yeah, who, who, who's interested in either joining our sorts of projects or 
just wants to talk about this stuff, um, I um, I will put myself on the on the list of emails that you can guess. Um, just Kathleen at Stanford.edu, Kathleen at HelloAllo.com is pretty easy. So um, that's my that's my well, that's a great plug. That's my Thank plug. you. I think a lot of people really appreciate that. That's very generous. You're clearly on the right track. Uh, I want to give the last word to you here. So we've mentioned your projects, but where can people support what you're doing? Where can they follow you or find you? Uh, I mean, you, you, sure, you can you can follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash Kathleen Voss. Um, and, uh, but then otherwise, I, um, you know, um, if, if, if you've got a child who's uh, looking to read, you can sign up for a wait list at hellohello.com. Um, and uh, if you work in... <laughs> speech recognition machine learning if you really care about design and and like building beautiful products that um that hopefully will make the world a better place just well there send you me go email. thank you so much i really appreciate sitting down with you you're a very fascinating and incredible person sorry for being so uh, complimentary <laughs> i know it makes you uncomfortable but i'm just genuinely in awe of what you've been able to do so i very much appreciate you taking any amount of time to sit with me it's been a pleasure um i hope you have a wonderful day and with that the official part of the podcast is over Whew. well that was very impressive i don't know about you but i'm blown away what an incredible story what an incredible young man Catalina is up to unbelievable things and What a breath of fresh air to just know that he's out there doing his thing. I know that I have really learned a lot and really enjoyed this episode, and I hope you have too. If you like these stories, as always, share, subscribe, rate it five stars, leave a nice review, do anything you can to help this podcast grow, and I would be forever grateful. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you more than you know, and I will see you next week.